old lady in her 60s searching for her missing son. That was the subject of an email that had arrived in my inbox a few weeks ago. It was a job offer the nurse of said old lady explained in a few short lines. Her contact details were listed below. By that point, I had been working as a private detective for a year and a half. I was always surprised when somebody actually contacted me about a real case. The job's nowhere near as fancy as it sounds. Movies depict private detectives as desperados or outcasts who go after the cases the police can't or won't touch. Reality is an entirely different story and much more mundane. Half of my cases concerned missing pets. The other half usually involved spouses suspected were being cheated on. I rarely get any serious work and I'm always strapped for cash. Of the few real cases that I got over the years, those concerning missing people were by far my least favorite. You never knew if you would find anything. Sometimes the missing person was long dead. Sometimes they've got a reason for hiding and in other cases, you come up with a big flat zero. If any of those is the case, it's always a hassle to get the client to pay up. When I looked at my empty calendar and thought about my similarly empty bank account, I knew that I couldn't be picky. I gave the nurse Stephanie a call and told her that I would accept the case and arranged for a meeting. A few days later, I went on the three-hour trip to the old lady's distant home. When I arrived in front of a grand, lavish mansion, my eyes grew wide. At first, I thought that I'd gotten the address wrong, but after cross-checking, I knew that I was in the right place. I followed a paved path through a rich and well-kept garden. As my eyes wandered around, I couldn't help but think of my measly two-room apartment. To say that I was jealous was an understatement. I guess some people just have it all. Rich people, to be precise. For a moment, I shuffled around in front of the door awkwardly, making sure my cheap clothing looked as presentable as possible. And then I rang the doorbell. A chime reminiscent of some classical music piece played on for almost half a minute before Stephanie, a friendly middle-aged woman, opened the door. Oh, it's so nice to finally meet you, mister. She furrowed her brow, trying hard to remember my name. Cybert, I helped her out. Oh dear, I'm so sorry, I don't know how. It's fine. I cut her off, giving her a well-meaning nod. Where's the old lady? Stephanie's friendly smile wavered and was soon replaced by a contemplative expression. I'm afraid Miss Annalise isn't doing well. She said as she led me inside and down a luxurious hallway. The floor was made of tiled marble. The wallpaper was richly decorated and expensive looking paintings lined the walls. As I followed Stephanie, I couldn't help but look around. If she noticed my odd, wide-eyed expression, she was discreet enough to pretend she didn't. After a little while, she stopped at a door to our right and led me into a small study. For a few moments, Stephanie was quiet and shuffled around before she sighed. To be honest with you, Mr. Seibert, I took the liberty of offering you this job without consulting Mrs. Annalise. I gave her a questioning look. I had had a bad feeling the moment that I had seen the mansion, and I didn't like where this was going one bit. Her son's disappearance was never easy on her. Over the years, over the decades, her condition has only worsened. By now. She broke off, shaking her head and blinked away tears. By now, she's almost catatonic. We can pay her a visit, but I doubt she's in any condition to even talk to you. I was at a loss for words. What even was this? If the old lady didn't know what was going on, then who would pay me? Still, I followed Stephanie along as she led me to a heavy hardwood door at the end of the hallway. It opened with a loud creak and we stepped into a richly furnished room. One wall was covered by a huge and beautiful landscape. The other, in an ornamented shelf, containing an innumerable amount of leather-bound tomes. Yet my attention quickly drifted to the tiny old lady at the other end of the room. 
She sat in an expensive armchair much too big for her. She did not look up when we entered, didn't even seem to realize that we were there. Instead, her eyes were almost entirely empty as she stared out of the room's single window. Mrs. Annalise, Stephanie called out, but the old lady did not react. While I waited near the door, Stephanie approached her. She whispered something inaudibly into the old lady's ear, but once more there was no reaction. Then her head slowly moved in my direction, and her sunken yellowed eyes focused on me. For a few moments we stared at each other before her, her head turned back to the window. She didn't say a single word. After a few moments, Stephanie returned to my side and gently led me outside and back to the study. I'm sorry, but Mrs. Annalise gave up hope a long time ago. She said, her voice heavy with pity. Excuse me, Stephanie, if I may ask, but then why this entire investigation? Oh, it's simple, really. I've worked for Mrs. Annalise for a decade and a half now. She might not talk much anymore given her condition, but she never mistreated me. You wouldn't know, but she has a kind soul. She always treated me like family. For a moment, she had to gather herself before she would continue. When the doctors told me she doesn't have much longer, I thought that I would be able to give back to her. I know the chances are slim, but maybe her son's out there somewhere. If she could at least see him one last time, I think it would help her make peace. I gave her a weak smile and nodded. Now then, Stephanie suddenly blurted out and picked up a small stack of photographs. That's her boy, little Marcus, she said and handed them to me. I couldn't help but frown when I saw them. I had expected this to be the case of an estranged family member, a son who had left home after coming of age and never to return. The boy in the picture, however, was young, almost a toddler no older than three. When I looked back at Stephanie, she gave me an expectant look, almost as if I would be able to magically solve the case from the picture alone. When she realized this wouldn't be the case, she seemed disappointed for a moment but spoke up again. He went missing on the 7th of April in 1988. I tried talking to Mrs. Annalise but it wasn't much use. This folder here though. She went on and took a heavy folder from a cabinet. It contains all their private research over the years. Everything she thought could be related to her son's disappearance. I'm not sure how helpful it'll be, but here you go. And with that, she pushed the folder towards me. I opened it and leafed through the contents for a few moments. I saw a birth certificate, an old police report about a missing child, and an almost infinite number of newspaper clippings. Thanks, I'll see what I can do, I told her as I picked up the folder. About the payment, I continued. I usually get paid via... Oh, don't worry, Mr. Seibert, she cut in. I already arranged for you to be paid an entire month's worth. Should the investigation last longer, we can talk about the details then. I gave her a surprised look and almost blurted out an objection, but I bit my tongue. My clients usually paid me by the hour, or once the contract was fulfilled. It felt wrong to go along with this, but... I could really use the money. Thank you, Stephanie. I'll do my best to find out what happened to the boy. I finally said, trying to sound as enthusiastic as possible. In reality, though, I was anything but about the case. You can call me anytime, Stephanie said as she led me to the front door. Or you can send me one of those emails. I think you young people prefer them. She added, laughing. Back in the car, I thought about the bits of information that I had gotten so far. Would I even be able to find anything? That little boy went missing over 30 years ago. Wouldn't all this be nothing but a wasted effort? And then I remembered that she had already paid me and a heavy sigh had escaped my mouth. Guess I could at least give it a try. When my eyes wandered to the massive folder on my passenger seat, however, I knew that I had a long night ahead of me. 
Once I was home, it was already early evening. I considered ordering myself some food, but considering my monetary situation, I settled on a quick microwave dinner. Afterward, I prepared myself a terribly strong cup of coffee and began working through the folder. The birth certificate told me the boy was born in 1985. He would be in his mid-thirties by now, of Caucasian ethnicity, blue eyes, and most likely brown or blonde hair. Great, I thought. That description fit at least half the guys my age in the entire country. Heck, even I had blue eyes and dark blonde hair. The first thing that I did was to check social media. I knew that it was most likely futile, but there had been a case that would have proven much easier if I had started with a simple Facebook search. By now, I made it a part of my routine to check out every single one of the more popular social networks. In the end, I found nothing like I had expected. My next step was to check out a few other public databases. Stay friends and the likes. I searched for both the child's date of birth and his name. Once more, I found nothing. It was early morning when I had finished going through the entire folder. My first hunch had proven correct. Most of it wasn't helpful at all. Instead, it painted a terribly desperate and sad picture of a mother whose child had gone missing. As I lay in bed, I wondered what that little boy's life would be like today. If I found him, would he even remember his real mother? Would he even want to get in contact with her? It was a topic that always hit close to home since I had been adopted. I remembered nothing about my biological parents. Mom and Dad had told me so while that I was still a child. I had always respected them deeply for it. Yet I had always felt my parents were a bit too different. They were both driven people, sometimes a bit too driven. Mom had become a toughened businesswoman in her time. Dad, on the other hand, had worked his way up to become the chief of police. Compared to them, I always felt a bit like a loser, an underachiever. Once more, I couldn't help but wonder if Marcus would even want to get in contact with a woman that he didn't remember. Heck, a woman that was catatonic and dying if I could trust Stephanie's words. How would he handle such news? Was he the type to ignore the entire thing? Those thoughts stayed on my mind until I had drifted off to sleep. Missing persons cases really were the worst. The next day, I went on with my work. It was time to get serious. I went through the folder once more and gathered what few files I thought might be useful. After I had gotten a hold of the old police report, I went through all their personal notes. However much I searched, nothing seemed to have come of it. No hint of the child, no further investigation, just nothing. Eventually, in my frustration, I paid the local station a visit. I was well known there, I was the son of the former chief of police. But there was also my failed attempt at joining the force two years ago. By now, I was a regular there, even if most people weren't too fond of me. I always felt their eyes watching me and I could almost hear them scoff and whisper about my occupation and the reason for picking it. One person who did like me was Susan. I could see her wide face and greasy hair the moment that I entered. As always, she sat in the back, wore her thick spectacles, and did her best to hide herself behind her computer screen. When I had made it halfway across the hall, she noticed me and gave me a bright, welcoming smile. She was always happy to see me, but for reasons that made me more than uncomfortable. To be honest, I didn't like her very much, and to say she wasn't my type would be an understatement. She was, however, always willing to help me out, and give me the occasional bit of information that I normally wouldn't be able to get my own hands on. New case, Daniel. She asked in her screechy voice, and giving me a bright smile and smacking her lips at me. I had to fight the urge to shudder whenever she did this and tried my best to return her smile. And you know it, Susan. I eventually said and handed her the police report. Going to be a tough one. She gave me a questioning look, but when I pointed at the date of the report, I saw her frown. 1988? She said in astonishment. You think you're going to find anything? I shrugged. No clue, but that's why I'm here. You mind helping me out a bit? Once more, I smiled at her, and for a second, 
I could see her blush before she hid her face from me. Well, I'll see what I can find. She mumbled nervously. For long minutes, I listened to the sound of her typing and clicking erratically before I heard a quiet. Bingo. A moment later, she printed out a handful of papers and handed them to me. Quite the case you got yourself this time, she said, going through her hair. A rain of dandruffs descended upon the floor. What do you mean? I asked, trying my hardest to ignore what I had just witnessed. Read it. Seems like you got yourself involved in an old kidnapping. Without another word, I began reading through the papers. The kidnapping happened on a Thursday afternoon. Mrs. Annalise had picked up her son at a kindergarten in a small town near her home. Like every day, the two of them walked back to her mansion. That day, a car came to a halt next to them on a small side street. Before she could react, the car door opened. The boy was dragged inside and the car vanished. It all happened within mere minutes. I looked at Susan who gave me a told you so look. I cursed to myself. Stephanie had said nothing about a kidnapping. Why hadn't she mentioned it? This changed everything. The description of the kidnapper didn't help either. It was vague. Strong, tall, most likely male. That was all. It happened so fast that she had barely gotten the chance to look at the perpetrator, but she had sworn that they had worn a disguise. Even worse, there had been no other witnesses. What made things even more complicated was the car used in the kidnapping. The vehicle had been reported stolen a few days prior. When it was found, no hints of the kidnappers remained. No prints, no DNA evidence, nothing. As I read through the file, one thing was obvious. All the details pointed at this having been planned long beforehand. A small street, no witnesses, a disguise, a stolen vehicle. The question was, why? The first thing that came to my mind was money. I read through the file once more, but I found no mention of a ransom note. If this had been planned, there would have been a reason for it. If not money, then what? Finally, I thanked Susan in a few words, and without waiting for a reply or another awkward attempt at flirting, I went on my way. Once I was back in the car, I gave Stephanie a call. She greeted me as friendly as when I had arrived at the mansion. After a quick greeting, however, I cut right to the chase. Why didn't you tell me the boy was kidnapped? On the other end of the line, I heard Stephanie gasp. Kidnapped? Yeah, little Marcus didn't just disappear, he was taken. Oh goodness no, she brought out. I had no idea. Mrs. Annalise mentioned nothing like that. Are you sure, Mr. Seibert? I was just at the station. I got all the information about the investigation right in front of me. There's no doubt. Now, Stephanie, I think this was planned from longhand. Do you know if Mrs. Annalise and her husband had any enemies? For a moment, she was quiet. When she spoke again, I heard the audible concern in her voice, or was it apprehension? What do you mean, Mr. Seibert? Now, Mrs. Annalise has a lot of money, and I'm sure quite a few people are jealous of her. But I never... No, Stephanie, I don't think this had anything to do with money. I cut her off. There was no ransom note or any mention of money anywhere. Are you sure they didn't have any enemies, and if not her... What about her husband or family? No, I will. There's that terrible thing that happened to Mr. James, but... What terrible thing? I cut her off again. Oh, maybe I should have told you before, but I never thought it was important. What are you talking about, Stephanie? Out with it. By now, I was getting annoyed at this woman and her timid, reserved character. Well, you know her husband, Mr. James, died, right? I knew. While most of the notes in the folder concerned her son, I had also seen a few about her husband's death. A newspaper article here, an obituary there, that kind of thing. But I hadn't taken a closer look at any of them. What Stephanie told me next, however, changed everything. It's such a terrible story. I think it was back in 1987. 
Mr. James was out for a walk and was hit by a car. There was nothing that anyone could do. The worst thing, however, is that they never identified the driver. Gosh, it's terrible just thinking about it. Hold on, are you serious? I thought none of this was important. What if it's the same people? Maybe they had a grudge against him or both of them for that matter. What if whoever ran over Mr. James is also responsible for the kidnapping? Come on, Stephanie. I didn't know about the kidnapping, Mr. Seibert, so I never thought. My God, if I had known, I... She broke off. I could hear her breathing and sobbing. And when I heard it, my anger at the poor woman subsided. She was right. How could she have guessed that any of this was important? Heck, even I didn't know if it was. No, Stephanie, I'm sorry, you're right. You couldn't have known. I've got to hang up though, all right. There's a lot that I've got to think about. I'll call you again in case I need anything else. She gave a weak reply and wished me good luck before she hung up. I sat in my car, rubbing my temples. I couldn't be sure, of course, but something about this entire case smelled fishy. For a moment, I wondered what I had gotten myself involved with. Should I even continue this investigation? What if all of this was way bigger than I thought and, well, dangerous? As much as I liked the movie depictions of private detectives, I could do very well without those types of cases. Eventually, after sitting in my car for what must have been a half hour, I grudgingly went back into the station. Once more, I felt myself being watched by those arrogant co-workers. Susan was surprised to see me back so soon. This time, I made an effort to smile at her and to sweet-talk her a little. After only a few minutes, I held the details of Mr. James' accident in my hands. When I read them, I learned yet another important detail. While they had identified the owner of the hit-and-run vehicle, the man had an alibi and it was revealed the car had gone missing the night before. For a long while, I stared at the sheet of paper in my hand. Another stolen car. By now, I was sure this was no mere coincidence. No, this was all related. For the next few days, I tried to uncover more details about the kidnapping and the hit and run. Yet I came up with a big fat zero. Sure, it had been over 30 years, but it was still strange. I even tried to find the owners of the stolen vehicles. But once more, nothing. I had hit a dead end. Eventually, I began thinking and decided on a different approach. If all this had been a case of revenge... Somebody must have headed out for Mrs. Annalise and her husband. Maybe I could find out who it was. When I thought about her mansion, I could only imagine how rich she must be. And what do all rich people have in common? I thought, grinning to myself. They all have blood on their hands. I was still surprised how much I could find on the two of them. They had both been born to wealthy parents and had married in their early 30s. An old article described it as a match made in heaven, while another one called it a financial marriage and a clever business ploy. Their riches, however, didn't merely come from their parents. Even at 30, Mr. James had already been massively successful, owned half a dozen businesses in town, and was involved in at least twice as many. His reputation, however, wasn't the best, and after some digging, I found quite a few rumors about him. I read about unfair competition, mistreatment of workers, threats, and even a few investigations that came to nothing. This didn't stop the two of them from making a big show of themselves. A public appearance here, a fundraiser there, and the occasional lavish party at their mansion. After hours of digging through old newspaper articles, I had finally struck gold. It was an article about Mrs. Annalise and Mr. James. It was published in a small, shady tabloid that I had never heard about. The paper, if you can call it that, specialized in bad-mouthing people and spreading rumors. It might very well have been a predecessor of internet blogs and magazines that focused entirely on celebrity scandals and spreading rumors. It was the title of the piece that made me read on. 
Filthy rich couple gets away stock free after running over a pregnant woman and killing her unborn child. As I read on, I learned the couple had attended one of their disgusting gatherings of the filthy rich. The two of them had supposedly been drunk beyond belief as they drove their car through the city. When a woman tried to cross the street, the husband, in a drunken rage, didn't slow down and crashed right into her. From the way the article was written and the over-the-top vocabulary, I had assumed it was a deadly collision. Yet the woman had merely been grazed and had only gotten light injuries. Those had been enough, however, and later that night, she had lost her child at the hospital. I read the article once more, this time more carefully, but no names were mentioned except for those of Mrs. Annalise and her husband. For about an hour, I tried my best to find out more about the accident, but it was no luck. Other than in that shady tabloid, it was mentioned in nowhere. I cursed, it was the same all over again. In frustration, I banged my fists on my desk before I picked up my phone. I stared at it for a long moment before I dialed a Susan's number. After only two rings, she answered and I heard her chortle in surprise. When I told her that I called about work, her mood had dropped. She lamented about me only ever calling her to get information and not caring about her as a person. I rubbed my temples as I listened to another one of her little tirades. After a bit of pleading and telling her she was the only one who could help me, she obliged. I gave her the names of both Mrs. Annalise and her husband, as well as the date mentioned in the article. Susan promised that she would have a look, but said that it might take a while. After all, there was real police work to do, she told me in a self-aggrandizing voice. Tja, real police work, my butt, I thought. I knew that she had nothing to do and probably spent most of her days moping around behind her computer screen. As if to prove me right, she called me back not even an hour later. She was quick and to the point, told me she had found the police report in question and had already forwarded it to my email. Once more I thanked her for taking the time before I hung up. When I read the report, I was dumbfounded. It told a completely different story. Mrs. Annalise and her husband had been sober and the woman had supposedly crossed the street with no regard for the oncoming car. Something about the report was weird. It was sloppy at best and short, almost too short. There was no mention of a pregnancy and not even the victim's name. The only information about the woman was that she wanted to remain anonymous. I reread the last line twice. She wanted to remain anonymous. It's a freaking police report, isn't it? I might have failed the entrance exam twice, but even I knew you couldn't just ask to remain anonymous. And what about the tabloid story? If it was nothing but a smear piece, then why turn an unimportant accident like this into a tragedy of such magnitude? There were enough other rumors about Mr. James. Nothing of this made any sense. I needed answers and all I had gotten so far was what ifs and more what ifs. It didn't take me long to get an idea. If I wanted to know what was up with this article, one person could definitely help me out. Finding the name of the tabloid's chief editor wasn't too hard. The paper might not have been popular with the public, but it had apparently been notorious in certain other circles. It had run for almost half a decade before it went out of business. The reasons were both monetary and publicly related. Guess you can only write smear pieces for so long before you get into trouble. I learned the man had long since retired but was still alive and to my surprise, wasn't living far from here. Multiple lawsuits had reduced him to a state of abject poverty and he was now living in an apartment even worse than mine. Once I had made it, I had to ring the doorbell for almost a minute until an angry old man had opened the door. He was small, almost withered, but surprised me with his flaring anger. What in God's name do you want? Am I talking to Mr. Meyer? The old man didn't react to my question, 
Instead, he continued ranting. Ringing the doorbell for minutes at a time and you're asking this? I ought to throw that door right in your stupid face. Either way, I'm not interested in whatever it is you're trying to... Mr. Meyer, hold on. I cut him off. I'm not here to sell you anything. I came because of an article in your newspaper. The man's eyes turned wide for a moment and I prepared myself for another set of insults. Instead, he broke into bursting laughter. Newspaper, that's a good one. I had no one calling that piece of crap something like that. Ah, now then, who did I smear? Parents, grandparents. Come on out with it, I haven't gotten all day. No, it's not about that. I'm actually interested in finding out more about a traffic accident that you covered. For a moment, the old man was quiet, apparently surprised that I wasn't here for some sort of legal action. When I handed him a copy of the article in question, a smirk appeared on his face. Now that's a story, all right. I remember it to this day. I got in some real trouble for that one. I almost lost the paper then and there. That rich lady and her crook of a husband. Well, those things you wrote, are they true? You can bet they are. All my articles are true one way or another. This one, though, I swear by it. Got themselves drunk and ran her over, just like that. Those rich folks in there. Yeah, alright, but I've got a copy of the police report right here. I can show it to you. It states that it was the woman's fault and... I was cut off when he broke into another bout of bursting laughter. And you believe it. You're as dumb as they come, aren't you? Isn't it clear what happened? They covered it up. Bought the police, the newspaper, everything. Couldn't risk a story like that getting out. Would be bad for business now, wouldn't it? Why do you think I printed it? I was quiet and kept myself from stating the obvious, but the man must do have noticed my reaction to his last question. Oh, I know well what you're thinking. That it's nothing but dirt, right? Let me tell you something. You might have that internet of yours now, but back in the day there wasn't anything like it. Throw the chief a few grand, pay off the reporters, and that's it. Especially those two. God knows what else they were involved in. Alright, Mr. Meyer, do you have any information about the victim? I would really like to talk to her. Heck if I know, I couldn't care less about her. Forgot the name the moment that I had printed the story. Heck, I might have never known it to begin with. Who knows, it's been over 30 years. A curse escaped my lips. The man noticed it but said nothing. Instead, he gave me an expectant look and extended his hand. I was about to reach out and take it, but before I could, he spoke up again. Now then, Mr. Private Detective, because that's what you are, right? How about a little something for my troubles? I couldn't help but stare at him and the disgusting, slimy grin that he gave me. Yet I didn't move a muscle. For a few moments, he stared at me before a frown showed on his face. Cursing to himself, he turned around and threw the door in my face. As I made my way back to the car, I couldn't help but shake my head. Sitting in my car, I massaged my temples. Yet another mystery to add to the list. As I drove back home, I wondered if any of this was even relevant to the case. What was I even investigating at this point? God, if I knew. Once I was back, I wrote down all that I had found out so far and put it in the order that it had happened. 1. Mrs. Annalise and her husband run over a lady. She loses her child. 2. Two years later, her husband dies in a hit and run. The perpetrator is never caught and the car was stolen. 3. Another year later, her child gets kidnapped. Again, a stolen car is used. By now I wondered if little Marcus was even alive anymore. If this really was a case of revenge and somebody had indeed murdered Mr. James, why wouldn't they do the same to the child? I don't even want to think about something like that. One thing was clear, I needed to find out who the woman in the accident was. It was clear she was related to all of this. When I called Susan once more, she made it no secret that she was annoyed at me. She said she wasn't supposed to give me any of this information and could even get in trouble for it. 
While I rolled my eyes, I gave her a mumbled apology and forced myself to tell her that. Maybe we should go on that date she mentioned so often. The moment she had heard those words, her anger had evaporated. I knew that I was being wrong, but I needed answers desperately. About that police report you sent me, do you think it's fishy? Uh, what do you mean? It's a police report, isn't it? Well, duh, Susan, but the name of the victim isn't even in it. I heard her fingers fly over the keyboard before she was quiet for a few moments. You know, I actually didn't read it. She sheepishly admitted. But you're right. Wants to remain anonymous, I've never read anything like this before. Her voice trailed off in contemplation. You think you can find out her name? Susan was quiet for a while. When she spoke again, her voice had turned into a conspiratorial whisper. No way. First, all of this happened over 30 years ago. Second, if there's no name here, then it's probably for a good reason. I don't know what you stumbled upon here, Daniel, but this looks bad. Well, are you going to do anything about it? What do you mean, wait, you think I'm going to investigate? There's no way I'm going to touch this. And anyway, I'm just a desk worker, IT. I can't just start an investigation on my own. Man, I guess you're right, I mumbled. Can you think of any other way to find out the woman's name? She was quiet again. I'm sorry, Daniel, but no. About that date, Wood Friday. Before she could continue, I'd already hung up. Freaking useless, the bunch of them. For the rest of the day, I tried desperately to find out who the mysterious woman was. I called hospitals all over town, but nobody could help me. They either brushed me off by stating it was way too long ago, or just flat out refused. All throughout the night, I continued my attempts. I scoured the internet, desperate for information, yet nothing seemed to exist about that woman. I was at my wit's end. The next day, my desperation drove me back to Mrs. Annalise's mansion. Sure, she was old, but if anybody might remember the name of the woman, it was her. I knew Stephanie wouldn't be too pleased about it, but there was nothing else that I could do. The moment I turned up at the door, Stephanie was surprised to see me. She invited me in, but asked why I had driven all the way here instead of just calling. Well, Stephanie, I don't even know where to start. This entire case has turned into something entirely different. Is this about Mr. James' accident and little Marcus's kidnapping? I sighed and shook my head. I wish, but what I'm here for is another part of the puzzle. With that, I told her about the night Mrs. Annalisa and her husband had supposedly run over a pregnant woman. Stephanie listened intently, but I soon saw her face contorted by shock and disbelief. There's no way, she started. You think any of this is true? Then Mrs. Annalise and Mr. James... She broke off, shaking her head. I tell you what, Stephanie, I don't even know anymore. What I know for a fact is that this police report is fishy. I handed her a copy of the report, but only she stared at it for a few minutes before she looked back at me. Even so, now, why exactly are you here today, Mr. Seibert? I'm not sure I. I'm here for the name of that woman, and there's one person who might remember it. At first, Stephanie didn't seem to understand, but then she realized what I was implying. No, there's no way you can talk to her about something like that. Reminding her of it, of her husband, good God, no. I'm sorry, Mr. Seibert, but there's... Come on, Stephanie, I snapped at her. I've tried everything, every last thing. Stephanie didn't say a thing. Her face had turned into a hard mask. No discussion, she said. A moment later, I rushed past her, and before she could react, I was already halfway down the hallway. Mr. Seibert, what do you think you're doing? She called after me, but I didn't stop. The moment I put my hand on the door handle to the old lady's room, she shrieked after me. When I turned around, her entire body was trembling and her face was as white as a sheet. Please, Mr. Seibert, she said with tears in her eyes. If you talk to her about those things, we don't know what might. 
My hand was still resting on the door handle, but I finally let go of it. What was I even doing? Eventually, I turned away from the door and walked back to Stephanie. Alright, I won't talk to her. But if you truly think it'll put her at risk, then there's nothing I can do. When I said this, she relaxed and some of the color had returned to her face. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you for understanding, Mr. Seibert. Yeah, but what about that woman? If I want to make any progress, I'll need a name. Could you at least try to talk to her? Or, I don't know, have another look through her documents. God knows if Mrs. Annalise and her husband really covered something up, then maybe there's still some sort of information. I can take a look, but I doubt I'll find anything new. All the things she's gathered about little Marcus were in that folder, so... Still, Stephanie, please give it another try. Every bit of information helps. I pleaded, giving the devoted nurse a warm smile. Finally, she nodded and agreed to have another look. For a moment, though, her eyes focused on me and she mumbled something to herself. I gave her an expectant look, but she shook her head. Oh dear, it's nothing, just a lot of chores left for the day. As I made my way back outside, I couldn't help but chuckle to myself. What chores could she have left to do around the place? Everything was in pristine condition and the old lady didn't seem to leave her room anyway. Well, whatever. The next few days were nothing but one disappointment after another. I continued my search in all directions, grasping even at the tiniest of straws. I rechecked the information about the stolen vehicles, paid all the hospitals a visit in person, and worked my way through snacks upon stacks of old newspapers. Yet I found nothing and it was driving me insane. On the fourth day after I had just returned from another fruitless trip to the library, I finally got something. Like every other evening, I was checking my emails. I was half asleep deleting spam and newsletters when I noticed an email from Stephanie. I found something on the woman. My eyes grew wide. Stephanie explained that she had rummaged through Mr. James' old study. The room was still in the same state after all those years and usually... Nobody was allowed to enter it. Given the situation, however, Stephanie decided to break the taboo. After hours of searching, she had uncovered an old document about the night of the accident and a photograph of the woman. Accompanying it were several notes by Mr. James that she didn't feel comfortable sharing with me. Instead, she had taken a picture of both the document and the photograph and had attached them to the email. I downloaded both files and the moment that they were finished, I opened up the first one, the photograph. When I looked at it, I was confused. And I was tired too, I thought, rubbing my eyes. I must have gotten the files mixed up. I closed the image that I had opened and went to the download folder and tried again. Once more, I got the same result. The woman in the photograph looked exactly like my mother in her younger years. I laughed and shook my head. What the? The resemblance was uncanny. I leaned in closer and focused on every detail of her face, but there was no doubt. This woman was an exact doppelganger of my mother. What a strange coincidence, I thought, as I closed the picture. When I opened the document, however, my head began to spin. A thought from about a week ago had returned to my mind. This was no mere coincidence. The name of the pregnant woman was stated as Lisa Seibert, my mother. I sat in front of the computer dumbfounded. For a moment, a sound that might have been a laugh escaped my mouth and then I shook my head. This had to be an elaborate joke, but by whom? The first ones that came to mind were those idiots at the station, but I doubt they would even bother to figure out what my current investigation was about, and if they wouldn't know how to spoof an email anyway. Susan knew, of course, but I struck her off right away, for obvious reasons. There was also this chief editor, but I doubted the old man cared enough to go through with something like this. Once more, I went over the email. I carefully checked the sender and made sure that it wasn't faked. I reread the few lines that Stephanie had written, re-downloaded the files and opened them up again, one after the other. Nothing changed. 
There had to be an explanation for this. Maybe it was a mix-up. Shouldn't Stephanie have noticed something about the name? It was the same last name as mine. I mean, come on. A second later, my phone was in my hand and I dialed her number. I tried once, twice, and then a few more times, but I couldn't get a hold of her. Was it already that late? I look at the clock told me that it was barely 10 in the evening. Was she already asleep? While I sat there staring at my mother's picture, I thought back to little Marcus's birth certificate. He had been born in 1985. I hadn't thought about it back then, and it hadn't even crossed my mind. But it was the same year that I had been born. He had the same skin and eye color, and he had most likely had the same hair color as me. It would all check out, I realized with a shudder. No, it made no sense. I had been adopted and there was a simple way to disprove any of the strange implications that came to my mind. With shaking hands, I picked up the phone again. It rang for almost half a minute before my mother answered. Daniel, why are you calling at this time of the night? For a moment, I almost blurted out the idea in my mind, but I bit my tongue. Hey mom, so I'm investigating this case right now and I'm wondering... Oh, again with that, why can't you finally get a normal job? You know, this work isn't sustainable. If you would just ask your father, I'm sure they would give you another chance at the academy. I'm sure that he can put a good word in for you. It would be so much better than this, this. She broke off, sighing in frustration. Mom, that's not important right now. I can't tell you the details, but I need to know the place that I was adopted from. What? Why do you need to know that? And anyway, can't you just look it up on that internet of yours? It's already late. I can't waste any more time. I think this case is related to one of the people who are working at the adoption center. You remember that middle-aged lady you told me so much about? What was her name again? Schneider? And how would I remember something like that? Really, Daniel? It was an obvious lie, but in her annoyance, she didn't even think twice about the story. Instead, she put the phone away. The sound of her stomping through the room and rummaging through drawers had reached my ear. In between, I heard her quietly cursing to herself. It was minutes, but she returned to the phone. In a few short words, she gave me the name of the adoption center, clearly fed up with the entire ordeal. Thanks, Mom. You really helped me out. Good night. Oh, good night, Daniel. She mumbled before hanging up. I googled the adoption center's name right away and was surprised to find out the place still existed. For a while, I clicked through their website, but of course, they didn't have a public database. I thought about writing them an email or calling them, but when I saw the time, I discarded those ideas. There was no way that anybody would answer me at this time of the day. Instead, I decided to get some rest and pay the place a visit first thing in the morning. I don't know how long I lay in bed, but sleep didn't come. My mind was too occupied and in uproar, and all my thoughts centered on one single question. Could it actually be true? No, I answered myself over and over and over again. At four in the morning, I gave up on sleep. I took a cold shower and made myself a steaming hot cup of coffee. For the next hour, my confused mind made up various scenarios. Maybe the woman that they had hit really was my mom's doppelganger. Who knows, maybe Mr. James had tried to figure out more about her and had somehow confused her with my mother. Heck, even if they had really hit her, it didn't mean a thing. Other similar ideas came to mind, but somehow they all felt contrived. Silly or even more unbelievable than the many implications on my mind. Eventually, I gave up and drove to the adoption center. When I parked my car, it was still almost an hour before the place opened up. I was antsy, shuffling in my seat and tinkering with my phone. Yet I couldn't keep my thoughts from lingering on the same topic. The moment the center opened up, I was out of the car and stepped inside. The older lady behind the counter looked up in surprise. Well, good morning, Mr. Early Bird. She greeted me with a hearty laugh. It was the first pleasant thing I had heard in weeks. Are you by any chance interested in finding out more about adoptions? 
I tried to return her smile, but from her reaction, I could tell that I had failed miserably. Sorry, no, I'm a private detective and I'm here to have a look at your database. Once I had identified myself, she led me to the office of their IT specialist. Tell you the truth, I'd be happy to help you myself. The problem is everything's on the computers these days and well, she said laughing again. I've never been good with modern technology. I'm sure Sam can help you out, but really, he's the only one into this whole internet thing. She led me to a small back room that might very well have been a janitor's closet. The lady opened the door and introduced me to a heavy-set balding man. He was stuffed behind a small desk and in front of a computer that might have very well been from the mid-2000s. The man looked up, staring at us like a deer caught in the headlights. Hey Sam, this is Mr. Cybert, a private detective. He's here to find some information on a case that he's working on. And with that, she turned around and went on her way back to the front desk. Sam didn't say a word, instead he continued staring at me while he tried his best to hide the general chaos of his desk from me. For a few painful seconds, all was quiet. Eventually, I cleared my throat and spoke up. All right, Sam, I started and took a quick glance over my shoulder to see if we were alone. This might sound a bit strange, but I'm actually here because of a personal issue. You see, I've been adopted at this very center myself, and I need to have a look at the data on it. He gave me a puzzled look before he shrugged. Sure thing, just give me a name and a date and we should be able to find it right away. Let's open this baby up. While he opened the database, he proudly explained the ins and outs of the new system that he had put together. It made finding all sorts of information way easier than before. I only listened with one ear and quickly told him my full name and those of my parents. It wasn't long before an entry popped up on the screen. You see, that's the beauty of the system. There you are, Mr. Seibert. He said and turned the monitor in my direction. Are there any pictures? Sure. After a few more clicks, an image appeared in the top right corner. I blinked and opened my mouth but closed it again when I didn't know what to say. The boy that I was staring at looked exactly like little Marcus. I started sweating, my head spun, and for a moment I held onto the desk to stop myself from keeling over. No freaking way. Sam didn't seem to notice, instead he sat there scratching his head while he scanned the file on the screen. Well, this is odd, he mumbled to himself. My head jerked in his direction. What's odd? This entry, I mean your entry. A good chunk of it is missing. I've got no idea why. He pointed at a few empty lines near the bottom of the screen. Probably nothing but a mistake, he said shrugging. I bet Clara didn't fill in the data correctly again. God knows she's terrible with computers. Hold on a moment. He heaved himself out of his tiny chair, pushed past me, and left the room. What are you? I started, but he had already waddled away down the hallway. For a while, I stood there and scanned the file myself. He was right, at least half of it was missing. After a few minutes, Sam was back, holding a giant folder in his hand. With a loud sigh, he propped himself back in his chair and haphazardly created a space between the chaos in front of himself. A multitude of old notes, papers, and trash descended to the floor between his legs, and then he opened up the folder and went through it. When he found what he had been looking for, he frowned. What's it now? I asked. Well, this one's just a copy, but a shoddy one. You see this? He asked, pointing at the page in front of him. When I focused on it, I saw that it was an old, crumbled up sheet of paper. Part of it was dirtied and only the head of the document had been filled out. No information about your biological parents. No proper date of birth, nothing. See? Just your name, the date of the adoption, and your adopted parents. I stared at him, not able to say a single word. Sam, however, went on undeterred. I'll tell you what, I bet the original got lost or someone spilled coffee all over it. God knows it happened all the time when Robert was still around. 
that the old fox tried to cover up his mistake, but forgot to fill out the rest. I gave him a weak nod with the word copy and the missing information. It was all too much. How about this? Sam started when he saw the dejected look on my face. I give the central archive a call and once I get a hold of the real file, I'll hit you up. Not like I've got anything else to do around here anyway. It might take a while, but if you've been adopted, I'm sure we'll find that file. Great, thank you. I finally brought out in a weak voice and gave him my number. I was about to leave, but then I stopped. You say, is there a chance you can print me a copy of that picture? Yeah, no problem. A few seconds later, I held a picture of a three-year-old me in my hands. And during my drive home, I still tried to convince myself that I was wrong. You know the truth, a voice in the back of my head kept protesting. The evidence is all there. No, I said out loud. It's not. As I drove on, my hands clutched onto the steering wheel. And after a while, I couldn't help but laugh and shake my head. The moment that I was home, I put the picture from the adoption center next to the one of little Marcus. Right at that moment, even the last bastion of refusal broke away. There was no doubt it was the same child. It was me. I was little Marcus. I sat there stunned, not able to move or do anything. My whole life, my entire world had just come crashing down and I felt as if I was trapped under an invisible avalanche. Everything was a lie, wasn't it? There was no alternative, was there? And then I thought back to all that I had uncovered. If my parents had really kidnapped me and taken me from Mrs. Annalise for revenge, then what about her husband? If all this was connected, then what about the hit and run? No, the murder. I thought about dad, about how protective he had always been of mom and how serious and driven a man he was. Now, if anybody would have hurt her, he wouldn't have let it slide. Dear God, dad, what did you do? The stolen car, as I remembered, the driver had never been identified. There had been no evidence and the entire investigation had been futile. I started to think, wouldn't it be easy for a police officer to hide the evidence? even if somebody had a hunch with no proof. I was already on my way to my parents' house when my phone rang. In the state that I was in, I picked up more by habit than conscious decision. The moment that I heard a male voice, I was confused and only then realized what I had done. At first, I didn't know who I was talking to, but then I recognized Sam's voice. He told me that he had called the central archives, but he had gotten nothing. No hint of any information, no entry. Nothing about my adoption at all. What does it mean? I asked in a quivering voice, but I already knew the answer. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Something like this has never happened. Even the archivist that I talked to was puzzled. I hate to say it, but if I had to guess, the file we looked at might have been a fake. And how is something like that even possible? You're telling me that somebody put together a file about me and... I broke off, not even sure what to say. Well, there might be other explanations. But... And who would even be able to do something like that? I yelled into the phone, not able to hide my frustration. For a moment, Sam was quiet, clearly taken aback. When he spoke again, his voice was timid. Well, somebody with connections, I guess. Our database is connected to some of the local hospitals, one or two of the orphanage, well, and the police, of course, but... As he rambled on, I didn't listen anymore. If the police had access to their database, it didn't mean that anybody would be able to. Sam was still rambling on, but I cut him off. Well, thanks, that's all I needed, I said, and without waiting for a reply, I hung up. No shock overcame me, no grief. In the end, it was just another tiny piece of evidence that added up to what I already knew. The moment that I arrived at my parents' house, Mom was surprised to see me. Daniel, what are you doing here? Don't tell me it's about that case of yours. You could have just called, it's not like. Where is Dad at? Is he home? I cut her off. Oh, I think he's in the back, she said, giving me a confused look. Without waiting for another word, I pushed myself past her 
and made my way to the backyard. Daniel, what's going on? She called after me. The moment that Dad saw me, he got up from his bench and walked over to me. Before he could say as much as a word, I spoke up. I know about Mrs. Annalise. He didn't show any reaction to the name, but I heard Mom, who followed me with a gasp. I couldn't hide the sad little smile that showed on my face. No, son, who's this Mrs. Annalise? Can't you at least give your old man a hug? And who would that be? In an instant, his face turned dark. I know the adoption document's fake, I started. Oh God, is that why you called me? Mom asked from behind me. We've been over this so many times, Daniel. I don't know why you have to. Quiet, Lisa. Dad cut her off. Now, what are you talking about, son? I know what happened 30 years ago about Mom's accident and about what you did. With that, I turned to face Mom. That rich couple that ran you over and you lost your child, didn't you? Mom stared at me with wide eyes. No, I don't know what you're talking about. She started but shuffled around anxiously. I don't know what this is all about, Daniel. Oh, how her eyes betrayed her. She was never good at lying. Daniel, don't you mean Marcus? I snapped at her. She cringed back a step as if I had hit her and put her hand over her mouth. A faint howl escaped her lips. I was about to confront her further, but Dad got a hold of my arm and pulled me back to face him. I don't know what you think you're talking about, boy, but you better stop. He said, his face red with anger. What about her husband? He was run over a hit and run, but I bet you remember it very well now, don't you? I asked, not bothering to hide the accusation in my voice. He stared me down, but this time he said nothing. It was you, wasn't it? After mom's accident, you decided. Be quiet, son, you don't know a thing. I know enough, I spat at him. Tell me one thing, mom, I said, turning to face her. Why did you take her child? No, I mean, why did you kidnap me? As she stood there, tears filled her eyes. I thought that it was shock or sadness, but then I saw the anger on her face. Danielle, that's what her name would have been, she finally brought out. That day they took her from me, from us, and then I learned she had a little boy of her own. I wanted her to feel the same thing. I wanted to, but oh, you were such a cute little thing that there was no way. Dang it, Lisa. Dad screamed and pushed himself between her and me. And you, you know nothing, not even in the slightest. There was nothing that we could have done. She and that husband of hers, they had it all covered up and put the blame on Lisa. They didn't even acknowledge the pregnancy. And then they threw a bit of money here and some there. And everybody was happy to trust their story. Even my colleagues at the station. And so you took things into your own hands, right, Dad? Oh, that's so like you. The slap that he gave me was hard, but it was nothing compared to the knowledge that I had said. No, all that I had guessed was true. The woman behind me, the woman that I had called mom for over three decades, was mumbling to herself. Son, I didn't, the man in front of me said. His hands were shaking and all the color had drained from his face. He had always been a big and strong man, but now he seemed small, weak, and most of all, old. So it's all true, I said to myself more than to him. And then I gave them both a long and hard look. Goodbye, I said, and then in a sarcastic voice I added, Mom and Dad. As I turned to leave, they didn't come after me. Neither of them said a word. There was nothing left to be said and nothing that they could have done. Once back outside, I jumped into my car and drove off. I barely made it a few blocks when all the bottled up emotions poured out of me. I hit the brakes hard, stopped the car and screamed at the top of my lungs. The freak out must have lasted for minutes, but I remember nothing about it. Once it was over, I was exhausted. My hands hurt, my knuckles were bleeding and I realized that I must have beaten the inside of my car in sheer outrage. For a while, I just sat there panting. It was all true, all of it. 
I took out my license and laughed at the name Daniel Seibert. Just another one of their lies, I said and threw it out the window. And then I remembered the email that Stephanie had sent me. Why hadn't she said a single word about the name? Shouldn't she have wondered about it and why hadn't she answered the phone? A second later, I dialed her number again and waited for her to pick up. It rang and rang and rang before I was notified the recipient couldn't be reached. I tried once more, but the same thing happened. As many times as I tried, she didn't pick up. Eventually, I dropped the phone and started the car again. The drive to Mrs. Annalisa's mansion would normally take about three hours. That day, in the state of sheer and utter rage I was in, it barely took me two. It was purely dumb luck that I wasn't stopped by the police. The moment that I had parked the car, I jumped out and rushed to the front door. I didn't even bother and didn't even think about the doorbell. Instead, I beat my still bleeding fists against into the heavy wood and called Stephanie's name. It didn't take long before I heard something inside. It was the sound of distant footsteps on marble. They were slow and measured as if my outrage was no reason for concern. Or, I realized, expected. When the nurse finally opened the door, she greeted me with her usual warm smile. Mr. Seibert, are you alright? You look terrible, and what happened to your hands? You know, don't you, Stephanie? For a moment, her smile vanished as she probed me. When it returned, it was different and full of mockery. And what might you be referring to, Mr. Seibert? The way she pronounced my last name, the heavy sarcasm she coded it in was enough to answer my question. When did you figure it out? Was it the moment you saw my mother's name on that file? For a moment she just stared at me before she laughed. Good God, a fine detective you are. Even if there had been a file like that, you'd think it would have been enough to give everything away. Even if there had been a file like that, what the heck are you talking about? I snapped at her. When she noticed the sudden anger on my face, she flinched and took a step back, but then she spoke again. I knew right from the start, long before you even showed up here and long before I wrote you that email. How in the heck did you? You forgot them, didn't you? Forgot what? The letters. She spat at me in a voice full of disgust. What letters? I started, but then the memory returned to me. Years ago, while I was still attending university for a few semesters, I had found a letter in my mailbox. It was supposedly written by my biological mother and said she wanted to get in contact with me. For days, I was a mess and tried to figure out what to do. Eventually, the letter ended up in the trash. It was better that way, I told myself, but I guess I wasn't man enough. For a while, the letters kept coming, but I didn't even open them anymore. By now, I had long since forgotten about them. Does she know? I finally asked in a broken voice. Stephanie shook her head. No, she started. Good God, it was so long ago. Back then, I had barely started working here. One day, I stumbled upon the picture of a little boy. When I asked if it was her son, she broke into tears. She told me the entire story. The accident, her husband's murder, and the kidnapping of the child. Yet she never found out what had happened to the boy. There were no hints, no evidence, nothing at all. And that's when I told her that we had to look for you. And then you found me and she sent me those letters, right? The nurse nodded. We hired a professional and you have no idea how happy she was when I told her about you. I had never seen her like this before and never have since. She cried for hours, but it was tears of pure happiness. I felt for her so dearly that day, and then we waited. With each passing day, she grew more excited, but no answer arrived. I told her that the letter must have gotten lost, and so we sent another one, and then another and another. And with each one, she withered away more. Her happiness turned to grief and eventually apathy. I told her that I would call you, visit you, drive her to your home, but by then she had given up. That boy, she said, is not my little Marcus anymore. He doesn't want to see me and probably doesn't even remember me. As she stared me down, throwing her unsaid accusations and condemnations my way, I couldn't face her. 
I couldn't face what I had done. So why now? I eventually asked, turning back to her, why after all those years? Because your mother's dying, that part's true. But I knew what would have happened if I had sent you more letters. You would ignore them just like before and you would have thrown them away. Even if I were to call you or visit you, you would probably not even talk to me. But when I saw your occupation, I knew there was a way. If I would figure it out on my own, if I knew what my parents had done, what I had done and you thought I'd. I broke off, not able to continue as if it all came crashing down on me. Can you forgive them for what they did? Can you? I said nothing but shook my head. And then slowly, ever so slowly, a burning rage rose from inside me. And to finally get me to meet her, you had to ruin my life. You had to show me all of it, every single last bit of what my parents did. But tell me, Stephanie, tell me one thing. What makes her so different from them? She and her husband were the ones who ran over a woman, killed her unborn child, and covered it all up to save their own butts. They didn't care one bit about what they had done. And you think she's any better than them. That's not... Stephanie started, but I didn't let her speak. She's the same, they're all the same. And you, you're the same as well. But Marcus, she's waiting for you. If you would just speak to her, just tell her who you are. Can't you at least give her that? For a while, I looked past her. I stared down the long and luxurious hallway and at the heavy hardwood door that led to the room in which my real mother was sitting. Even now, she was most likely staring out that one single window. But then I looked at Stephanie once more before I shook my head and turned to leave. Stephanie called after me, her words a mixture of pleas and accusations. I gave them no heed. They were all terrible people, each and every one of them. I started the car and drove off. I knew that I would see none of them again. And as I left my dying biological mother as well as the people who had raised me as their own behind, I knew that I was as terrible a person as all of them.